All right, Reggie Senior, I really appreciate you taking the time to um, come on the platform today. I know you don't have a whole lot of time, so um, I know hopefully in the future we can get a longer interview with you, but I appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure to have you, and welcome to Bomb First. No problem. So I wanted to start off, first of all, with um, if you could tell me any stories about um, some of the people that you dealt with in the Compton and Watts area that were really active back in the day that the YouTube people talk about, whether it's, you know, the death row people or just, um, you know, uh, well-known active people in that area that you had dealings with back in the day. Well, I could start off with uh, probably a notorious person that uh, back in the day that was involved heavily in a little narcotics dealing and some of his family members was kind of involved in gangbanging. I had a best friend, one of my best friends that grew up, that I grew up with in the projects, Imperial Course Housing Project, by the name of Frank McGowan. Frank is uh, deceased, but uh, his son uh, was Edward McGowan, known as Manpower from Bounty Hunter. Uh, so I knew him since he was like a, like a baby. Uh, and, um, kind of, you know, watched him grow up a little bit along with, you know, his uh, father, Frank. But maybe more notorious, for lack of a better word, was his uncle, Rene McGowan. Rene was really quite involved back in the day from the Nicholson Garden Project, but he mostly were in, in a narcotic trafficking, uh, who was subsequently killed uh, uh, and found murdered, I think somewhere near his home or near some hills or something back in the day. But Rene was quite, quite active and quite involved in that, um, that business back there with Tootie Reese and a lot of them other guys from the Watts area. Um, but I grew up with them, uh, as I said, his father. So when I got into law enforcement and we start in the city of Compton and started encountering some of that activity, that narcotic activity as well as gang activity, I had dealings with both Rene McGowan and Manpower. But I never had any problems with any of them because they always respected me uh, from, from growing up with the father and their known family. You know, all our families were close. So in all my dealings, and some of uh, as far as law enforcement is concerned, uh, I got the utmost respect from all of them. Even till the day, even with manpower, naturally Renee is gone. But um, it was quite challenging at times because of how you get caught up in the middle of some of those uh, relationships and family relationships. But it was never anything hostile or or disrespectful uh, as it related to Renee McGowan and both manpower, who was Edwin McGowan. Uh, another one that comes to mind right away since we're talking about before I got involved in law enforcement, was a China dog, uh, Marcus Nunn. Well, Marcus, I didn't really had any, uh, how would you say it, incidents or uh, dealings with Marcus until uh, I got on the police department. But his family, I knew back from the Imperial Court days. Uh, I knew his mom, Royal, you know, Evelina, she was, almost like a mother to me. She was a very good lady. She she looked out for me, and I love her to death. So she uh, since has passed on. But when I got into law enforcement, and Marcus was involved in Ludus Park Pyros, and also his sister, Sylvia and Cynthia. But I always had, again, the utmost respect from them because of my relationships with their, with their family. Uh, even till the day with Cynthia and Marcus, you know, uh, we lost Sylvia some time ago, but they were very active, <laughs> uh, which people probably already know. But um, I, you know, I can't sit here and say anything bad about any of them. I may not agree with some of their choices of involvements or with the law or whatever. But uh, like I said, I always had the utmost respect for them. A third one that comes to mind. Uh, also would be, uh, well, Tookie Williams, you know, uh, I did in the mix with Tookie. I, my, my Tookie story goes even back before Tookie was kind of well-known or 
Well, I was working in Imperial Course Housing Project as a, one of the assistant directors for the Rec and Park. So a lot of those guys back in the early 70s, the stuff that started the P.J. Cripps, Anthony Blaylock in particular, A.B., he was sort of like the shot caller for the P.J. Cripps. And this was the early 70s. And so they start farming. So, you know, most of the time these gang members, they find a part to uh, uh, more or less associate with or, or identify with. And the Imperial Course uh, housing project and the gym field and stuff was where P.J. Cripps got started. And as I say, A.B., Anthony Blaylock, who was more or less the shot call at the time, and a lot of the other guys that grew up over there, um, they always had the utmost respect for them because most of them played, were athletes. And they played like either football for me or basketball or, or baseball for that matter. So I always knew them. But anyway... When A.B. and them used to hang out over on the gym field and stuff, I'd go over there, and if they were doing too much ruckus, I'd go to them and say, hey, man, you guys got to move on or take it off the park or whatever, and they would, no problem. But on this particular day, um, Tookie Williams, which I didn't know him as Tookie or by his first name or anything at the time, uh, he was over there hanging out, uh, being Tookie, as he started being, you know, muscle I said bodybuilding and walking around without his shirt and more or less bullying people. Well, my father, you know, because we all was raised in Imperial Course, a family of 17, you know, so we were well known. But my dad, uh, I'll say this about him, God rest his soul, but he was a functioning alcoholic, really. I mean, he had two jobs. He raised all kids, same mama, same daddy, in the Imperial Course housing project. But he was known in the project, so in the evenings or sometimes when he wasn't working one of his jobs, he would be drinking and he would walk around the project area. And he would be, you know, like saying, hey, look up, and, you know, just doing typical things a person that's under the influence would do. But the, everybody knew him. So <coughs> this particular day, I guess, uh, Tookie was over there with the group, and my daddy was somewhere near the gym field or walking to the liquor store, probably to get him a, a little drink. But Tookie and a couple of those guys were going over toward the liquor store as well. And I guess my daddy did his old favorite thing about, hey, look up, telling people to look up or something. And a Tookie punched him in the face and almost, I think he knocked him down, but he cut him real bad across the nose. So soon as that happened, I mean, the people at the liquor store called for ambulance and all that. But a couple of guys from the project who knew me ran to my house because I only lived right across the street from the project and told me, hey, man, this guy named Tookie just punched your daddy and knocked your daddy. They taking him to Martin Luther King. I go, oh, no. So truthfully, like I said, this was before my law enforcement day. I had me a little 38. I had just got from Woody Sporting Good, a little 38. I grabbed my 38, and a friend of mine was there with me. And so we left out the door. I'm going to find whoever this fellow is. I don't care nothing about his reputation or what. I was going to do something bad. I, I'm afraid. But Anthony Blaylock got a whiff, A.B., got a whiff of that I was coming looking for Tookie. So Anthony came and shortstopped me from coming from my house to go over to the gym area to see if he was over there. And Anthony stopped me, and he go, Coach, because they always call me, Coach, Coach, I know what happened to your dad. Hey, man, this is a guy. I could take care of it. It ain't no problem. You know, I'll, I'll have him. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, don't do anything. I said. So I respected Anthony as he respected me. So I said, hey, man, I'm, I'm not tolerating this. This ain't right, you know. So next thing I knew, I back out. Anthony went and got Tookie, and he brought him up to me, and he says, hey, this is a, his, his son, He's not happy about it. And, and Tookie said, hey, man, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. I, I just kind of lost my head. I thought he was just an old man just messing with me. And I said, no, that's the way he acts. So we kind of, like, settled it. I, I, I slowed down. So what he did, he says, they taking your dad to the hospital, I heard. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So he walked up to me, and he put a $100 bill in my hand. And he said, well, maybe if they charge anything, I'll pay for it or whatever. So I just looked at him, and I backed off. I said, okay. And I let that go. For ever since then, I was known as coach to even him. You know, when they come back around the project, my daddy turned out to be all right. You know, got a few stitches and, you know, we went on. But about six or eight months later, I joined the Compton Police Department as a reserve police officer. And this was about 76, 1976 or so. 
And so one night while working as a reserve, we were working the late shift. And uh, at this time, this is when Tookie and Baby Boy and all of them started getting their little reputation. And they were living at the Red House, which is in Compton on Pine off of Santa Fe. I think Bob Simmons was over it at the time, or, or uh, I'm not sure who, but they were running the Red House, which a lot of those guys that were like on like a quasi probation or something would be placed there. And they would have parties in front of it and, and all this, uh, all kind of ruckus stuff with all these crips. Well, one night I'm riding with a guy, God rest his soul, Ron Rosser, who was a known competent police officer, like also real buffed and kind of, hey, nobody to fool with. Well, this particular night, they put out a call about a big party and some crips blocking the streets over at the Red House on Pine. And uh, they were putting a call out. And they said the main suspect is Tookie Williams. Tookie. So all of a sudden, the radios start clicking and stuff. And the district unit that was assigned to the district he gets the call, but the first thing he said, where's Rasa? And they went to frequency two. And so when they went to frequency two, all the police that were going to respond more or less weren't going in there, just one unit or that district unit. But they wanted Rasa to go in with them because Rasa had dealt with Tookie before. And um, Tookie kind of respected Rasa a little bit. So they wanted Rasa, be sure they get a hold of him before they'll go in there. So we met at, it was old Sears over there on Long Beach and uh, uh, right off of Rosecrans, but Sears, it was over there. So they met over there before they went down to the scene, you know, all the policemen met. And so they were talking about their approach and their tactics to go in, because it was supposed to be a large, large group. But none of them wanted to go in unless Ron Rasa took the lead. And so I'm a reserve, I can't say much, you know, but I did say to Rasa, <coughs> I said, hey, man, I know him. Uh, well, he said, oh, man, you don't know nothing about Tookie. But Tookie is a bad guy. and You know, you can't say nothing to him. Uh, I got this. I said, hey, no problem, you know. So after we got together and we deployed and we went over there. And sure enough, as before we approached the Red House, I mean, it was cars all out in the street, partying, loud noise, music. This, this was midnight, 12, 31 o'clock, early morning. And so... <laughs> We got there, so the cops kind of came in a circle, you know, to surround the group. And Rasa got out the car and walked up to the group and walked up towards where Tookie was. And, and so Tookie looked at Ron and said, hey, I knew they were going to have to call you. They wasn't coming in here without you, huh? And so Ron, yeah, yeah, this and that. But I'm standing next to Rasa. And so Tookie looks over. He goes, coach, that you? Because I'm in uniform and stuff. And I said, yeah. He said, you the police? I said, yeah, I'm the police. He said, he turned around to the group and said, hey, this is my, I don't want the N word, but he said, this is my end. This is, you know, this is, this is coach, you know. And he said, what's up, coach? What you want us to do? Rasa looked around and the other group, they looked at me like, what the heck is he? And so, so I said, man, you guys got to break this up, man. You know, you can't have this. He turned around to the group. He said, hey, let's go. Coach said, we got to go. We're getting up out of here. And they got up in the cars and they left. Ever since that day, if I was working as a reserve, and if anything had to do with Tookie, and they call, hey, is right here tonight? Is <laughs> also right here? So uh, I always had that respect for him and had a couple of little encounters with him. And as a matter of fact, he contacted me just before his execution and stuff and sent me a letter and to the, through the station and stuff and said how he appreciated me. And at this time, he was seeking any character, uh, what they call character letters, because of his, I guess they were reviewing whether or not the governor was going to stay his execution or whatever. And uh, I couldn't write nothing, you know, from that standpoint. But I was told I could do something as an individual, not as, at that time, I was a police, if I wasn't a sergeant. Yeah, I think I was a sergeant at the time. I just wrote a personal letter to him just directly from Reggie, not a uh, sergeant. And matter of fact, I attended his funeral, or took his funeral when, uh, when he had it. But hey, that's my Tookie Williams story. <laughs> but uh, those are some of the main three that uh, right off the bat, I know that's kind of known on the social world uh, 
networks and stuff, and I thought, started I talk about them. 